Good evening. About time for us to begin our midweek refresher. Appreciate all of you being here. Hello, everybody on Facebook. We've got a few announcements we'd like to bring to your attention tonight. So you realize everybody on Facebook Facebook's wondering what's going on. So there was good news from uh, Winston and Geneva, they got a good report from the oncologist. Apparently the treatments are working and the next step is try and find some relief from him and his, his back. He's been in a lot of pain for that. Please remember Patty, her cancer in her lip has returned again, third time. She'll start radiation treatments this week? Going tomorrow. Going tomorrow. Uh, Wavon White is still waiting on tests. She's got the Tumor, I don't know what it is, a knot or? Hopefully it won't be bad. Yeah, yeah. And Juanita Falejo's uh, grandson had dental surgery recently. Uh, please continue to remember B.A. And, and Ronnie Morris. They're both, has some health issues. Rex Mays, Joyce Bishop, continue to remember them in prayers. Our senior Sunday is this coming Sunday, so. Uh, <coughs> Highly encourage you to, to come, attend. We're going to have a potluck dinner afterwards, homemade ice cream, uh, set the fellowship room up, some decorating. and We have five seniors, and we're going to celebrate them and, and uh, their accomplishments to date and then bid them Godspeed and whatever's next on their, their calendar. And so please, please make plans to, to come and attend and uh, stay with us and have some lunch, potluck lunch. June 10th is our VBS. It's uh, Saturday morning VBS. We'll have some more information about that later. Men's breakfast tomorrow morning. And that's all I have. Is there any other announcements, prayer requests that we have? Ozzy's leading our singing tonight, and Smitty will continue his series of lessons on prayer. That's everything. We'll begin with the word of prayer. If you'd bow with me, please. <clears throat> Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for this day in which you've given us to live. We thank you for this, uh, I, I called it a midweek refresher, and that's, that's just what it is. It just charges our batteries and, and refreshes us and breaking open the bread of life and being around our brothers and sisters and singing a few songs of praise to you. It's just a, just a wonderful time. We, we appreciate deeply being here. We appreciate the family that meets here at the heart of Texas Church of Christ. May we continue to grow closer together in love and work and service to you. And we know this is all possible because of the sacrifice of your son, dear Heavenly Father. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for his death, his burial, and his resurrection. And we just ask that you help us to, in a deeper and closer and more intimate way, study him and his life, his words, and and all the things that he did that, that make all this possible, uh, first of all, in that he fulfilled your will, but leaving for us that perfect example that we might follow. We ask that you be with those who are on our sick list here at Heart of Texas. We named off just a few tonight, and there's, there's others on that list. And we just pray that you be with them as the great physician, heal them, restore their health, and, and give them the, the peace and the comfort that they need and their, their families and their loved ones so that they can return and, and be with us once again. We ask that you be with Ozzy tonight as he leads us in song, be with Smitty tonight as he leads us in a, a study of prayer. May we benefit from these and 
and, and have something that we can take home and, and use and, and in increasing measure in our daily lives. Again, we're just so thankful for everything you've done for us, dear God. We appreciate it very, very much. And we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Page 396, page 396. Let's sing the first and the third. Let's just sing. There's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. No. Sing the first and the fourth. Let's go sing. Hum yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Hum yourselves in the sight of the Lord. Hum yourself in the sight of the Lord. Hum yourself in the sight of the Lord. Hum in the of the Lord. And he, he will lift you up. And he, and he will lift you up. We're saying the first and the third. And after this, Brother Smitty will have the floor. Let's go to sing. I'm in the way, the bright and shining way. I'm in the glory land, glory land way. Tell me the world that Jesus saves today. Yes, I'm in the glory land.
into their routine. I am, yes, sir. <laughs> Good evening. Tonight we're looking at hindrances to prayer. And uh, Mike's passing out some questions we'll ask ourselves as we go through this tonight. Um, but as usual, if we're going to have a class on prayer, we should begin with prayer, shouldn't we? Will you bow with me? Our Almighty Father in heaven, how wonderful is your name. How wonderful is the name of Jesus, our Lord. We, we just ask, Father, that you teach us to pray and help us to realize that you are God, you are the creator, and we are mere humans, and that our, that our duty on this earth is to serve you, and that we should be seeking you in all that we do. This we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I've been looking to find quotes to put at the top of the page. I, always, I think they're kind of interesting just to add a little bit to the lesson. And our main scripture tonight we'll be looking at is two. We'll look at James 4.14 and 1 Peter 3.7. But I really want to begin, if you would, turn your Bibles to 2 Chronicles 7.14. Second Chronicles seven fourteen. This is a uh, this is God's answer to Solomon's prayer when Solomon dedicated as Solomon prayed to dedicate the temple. Uh, this is God's answer to Solomon's prayer. We used to see this quite a bit. We don't see it much anymore. Uh, and most of the time, it has to do, when we see it, it has to do with, the, with politics. But this isn't really about politics. This is about, this is God's answering prayer and God telling us about prayer. And this passage tells us a lot about prayer. So we'll read it, and I want to look at it phrase by phrase a little bit. Verse 14. And my people who were called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and will heal their land. Okay. Uh, modern day, we don't pay much attention to form anymore, but in this case, Solomon paid attention to form. He prayed. The temple was filled. Matter of fact, the temple was so... The Holy of Holies and the Holy Place were filled so that with uh, a fog or a mist so that nobody could even go in there. God was present at this. And it's made a pretty strong statement about how he, how he would answer prayer. And he explained what prayer does. Uh, God is a God of order. And even modern day, you know, 1 Corinthians, as Paul writes about conducting church services, he talks about order in church services. Uh, so God's not a God of disorder. He's a God of order. And we'll, let's look at this a little bit. It says, if my people who are called by my, na by my name. Prayer is a unique privilege of God's people. Notice he says, people who are called by my name, being called by God's name is special. Uh, God hears and prayers and answers of his children. In this instance, the whole nation of Israel had come together to dedicate service to the Lord. He says, if they shall humble themselves, humility precedes prayer. Pride cannot pray. Repentance precedes prayer. This text focuses upon the living presence of God. Uh, as we mentioned, God had filled, inhabit the, inhabited the Holy of Holies and where no one could even get into the temple because of his presence. To see God can only result in worship and prayer. 
Humility, coming into the presence of God, is dependence. It's uh, confession of helplessness. It's uh, honesty. It's reality. Coming to face to face with God. Pray. Needy people pray. Penitent people pray. Prayer is the foundation for all renewal and reformation. How many of us pray last as a last resort? We should be praying first to begin anything. We, uh, we shouldn't be, we shouldn't run, hide, blame, deny, or fight. We should pray. Prayer is the first thing we should look to. Um, God does not want us to fall, but if, he, if we do, he wants us back. Let's, uh, let me read you uh, Ezekiel 18, 21 to 24. It's a little lengthy here. <clears throat> but... This is beginning verse 21. But if the wicked man turns from all his sins which he has committed and observes all my statutes and practices justice and righteousness, he shall surely live, he shall not die. All his transgressions which he has committed will not be remembered against him because of his righteousness which he has practiced. He will live. Do I have any pleasure in the death of the wicked, declares the Lord God, rather than that he should turn from his ways and live? But when a righteous man turns away from his righteousness, commits iniquity, and does according to all the abominations that a wicked man does, will he live? All his righteous deeds which he has done will not be remembered, for his treachery which he has committed and his sin which he has committed, for them he will die. God wants us to come back to Him. God wants us to turn from evil ways and come back to Him. Uh, what a God. And He'll forget them. He'll forget your iniquity if, you, if we repent. He'll forget our sins. Now then, the next phrase in, in this, Deuter, in this uh, Second Chronicles passage about seek my face. God says, those who seek my face. That's an interesting phrase. What is seeking, by the way? Looking. Looking. I'll give you an example of seeking. Uh, when, my, when my son was uh, three or four years old, we were in Sears in, in uh, Mesa, Arizona, and I was looking at fishing equipment, and I was engrossed in that stuff, and I looked up, and he was right beside me. I looked up one after looking at stuff for a little bit, and he was gone. He was nowhere in that aisle. I ran to the next aisle. He wasn't there. That was scary. Let me tell you, that's what seeking is. I was seeking him, seeking something lost. I lost a relationship with my son. I lost a relationship with my son. I failed in my responsibility. God says, seek my face. Now, Seeking God, that's pretty. That's an active, serious word to me. I hope you agree with me. So God says, seek my, if you seek my face, I'll forget your iniquities. And then he goes on to say, uh, face to face. He didn't say, seek going to church. He didn't say, seek my law. He didn't say, seek uh, being good for a few weeks. He said, seek my face. What's that mean to you? Hmm? Be Christ-like. Be Christ-like. Yeah. Anymore. Seek my attention. Parker? Andrew? My attention. My attention. Parker? Well, my thoughts are, I get the comparison of the Lord's Supper mm -hmm. and how we are searching, searching it out and, and the persecution that he went through. 
I think that's a part of this. Okay. Okay, Mike? I was just going to say your face is your identifier. Okay. How people recognize you. So if you seek God's face, you're seeking the one and only, the true God, the, the real God, the personal God. Okay, Louise? Well, sort of, sort of on the same line as what Mike just said, I, I was thinking of like a blind person, uh, when they want to know who you are, they ask to touch your face. And they feel your face to get to know you and to get an image of who you are. And that kind of reminds me of us seeking God's face. We need to get to know him. Okay. And in the back? Think of desire. Desiring to have a relationship with God. Okay. Wanting to know him on a passionate, deep level. That's what I see when he says seek my face. Very good. I, I'll, I'll give you another example uh, when I first started dating Louise, uh, I would take her back to the dorm, dorm at Lubbock Christian, the women's dorm, and I'd go to my room, dorm room, and I'd pick up the phone and I'd call her. And it, it's just like, it was torture being away from her. Not so much anymore. <laughs> That's what seeking to be God, like everybody said. That's seeking to be with God and getting to know God and becoming more like God and and practice coming in, practice coming into His presence, and then turn from their wicked ways. Uh, sinners must repent. Everything in the Scriptures tells us to repent. Turn away from your ways. Turn away from following the ways of the world and follow me. So uh, there's no such thing as cheap grace. Now, that sounds funny. If you think about our current modern day teaching on grace, it's going to sound a little strange to you. But think about it. Grace demands that you follow Jesus. Parker? I've been reading... James, and, and there's a paragraph before by a writer, but he, he brings out some thoughts about this the faith, and, and this faith has to do with your whole being, and that would be included uh, in getting to know God better uh, with all of your being, uh, whatever you do, uh, you're looking toward God, and that comes up in these scriptures mm -hmm. that you've just quoted. Your whole being, and and I really thought a lot of those, I've been thinking about it all day, about all of our emotions and all of our emotions and all of our wants and everything should include God. Should include God. Smitty, what did you just say? I'm not saying, what did you just say? But, uh, <laughs> did you say, what did you say about grace? Did you say there's no such thing? There's no such thing as cheap grace. What do you mean? <coughs> Well, what do you think I would mean by that? Cheap. <laughs> that there's a cost that comes with grace. Let me put this. Let me put this this way, as Brother Hodge put it in his in his book. Sin is sin, and those who sin are damned. So that's all of us. Yeah. Those who so those who sin, live a life of sin, are damned. Uh, sin, we don't want to sin, but First John tells us if we, if we're walking in the light, striving to be with God, if we fall, God, say, Jesus' blood cleanses us from our sin. But that's prerequisite on that is walking in the light and trying to walk with Jesus, not trying to walk our way, but in Jesus' way. Uh, and then lastly in that passage in 2 Chronicles he says uh, I will heal the people and I will even heal the land what a wonderful God turn back God says turn back to me and I will heal you and I will heal your land it's, it's pretty impressive uh, 
I think it's imperative that we remember God promised to heal the land. He also promised to condemn those who don't. He, that passage, he says, those who, if you don't, you're going to regret if you don't come back to me. God keeps all, A-L-L, -L, his promises. We don't want to teach that so much anymore, but it's true. Amen. <clears throat> okay, let's look at, begin reading James 4.14 and then we'll read 1 Peter 3.7. And you wonder, as I wondered about this most of the week, how's this fit in with this lesson tonight? I think I got it. <laughs> It says, yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. And then 1 Peter 3, 7. You husbands, in the same way, live with your, lives, live with your wives in an understanding way, as with someone weaker, since she is a woman, and show her honor, a fellow heir of the grace of life, so that your prayers will not be hindered. I think just to introduce, our, as we get into these questions, we're going to talk about who are we to question God? Who are we to challenge God? We're a vapor. We're a short time here on earth. We're not, you know, people won't remember, very few of us, people will remember 50, 60 years from now. Uh, and then husbands, being in a, Bad relationship with others can hinder your prayers. Especially someone you, you live with and love, it can hinder your prayers. And, and Peter warns us to not have our prayers hindered by our own actions. <clears throat> Great things happen to those who pray. When believers pray, God does something. To pray is to invite God back into our world and into our lives. And as the song says, Oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not carry everything to God in prayer. The song says a lot, doesn't it? How much, how important is prayer in our walk of faith, in our, in our work on this earth? We, we pray little or none. Sometimes prayer is a last resort for us as we're having trouble. Uh, maybe it's just something we need to be paying attention to first. Uh, we, uh, there's no such thing as unanswered prayers, but there could be wasted <coughs> prayers Will, have you ever tried entered, entered into pray into prayer and just not recognizing that you're talking to God and just say, Lord, help me with this or or help me answer this, help me get this, or is there prayers for like the Janice Joplin song? Oh Lord, give me a Mercedes Benz. Some people pray for the physical things rather than what's good and what God wants. And it could be a wasted prayer. Uh, Satan gets in our way of prayer. The world gets in our Satan. It's his world. Gets in the ways. Gets in the way of our prayers. How many of you have time to pray? <laughs> Sometimes it's hard. To, it's hard to get time to pray. That happened to me. This week, as other things came up, I, I caught myself prepping for this class on prayer as I could get to it and not praying about this class. I caught myself a couple of times about that. And we can get caught up. It's easy to get caught up in that. Sometimes we exchange the good for the best. Or we exchange the best for the good. That's what, I said that backwards. Sometimes we exchange the 
best for the good? What could be better than that being being in a face-to-face -face relationship with God? Is baseball better than that? Is football better than that? Is a card game better than that? Is fishing better than that? Excuse me, Mike. <laughs> <coughs> but we need to think about what's, what's the most important thing. Uh, what, does, what does prayer demand of us? Then, giving that introduction, what, does, what do you think prayer demands of us? Honesty, sincerity. Vulnerability. It, it, it demands us to come to God as tainted and as sinful and as remorseful and praising and loving and honoring and glorifying. It, okay. it demands all of us. Okay. Everything from us. Very good. What else? Nakedness. Hmm? Nakedness, okay. Meaning exposing yourself totally to God. What else? It seems like um, the Bible talks a lot about the heart. So the both, so the sincere heart. But I think that's accompanied with the general genuine relationship, even if it's it's your first time and it's a genuine cry out to, to God, and you're repenting as turning away from, it's the genuineness of your heart seeking that relationship. I think that has to be first, because if me and you are to have a relationship and I walk with you and talk with you and you do all that, the likelihood of you helping me when I need it is higher. Mm -hmm. But if you never have that relationship and I just come in and ask you for Okay. Mike? I, I keep going back to something that, that you mentioned earlier, time. Uh, we're always so busy with whatever. And it seems like sometimes God in my prayer life just takes a second seat. I mean, to piggyback off of that, when I think of prayer, I think I'm, it's me talking to God. And when in my day do I not have time to talk to God? Whether I'm driving to work, whether I'm driving home from work, whether I'm delivering mail on my route and I'm alone and I'm talking to God, I'm praying to God right. because that's between Him right. and I, right. nobody else. Time is, I think, time's the biggest challenge and commitment. It is for me. Time and commitment to spending time with God. Now, now Let's use, think about Daniel. We just studied Daniel. Daniel's enemies knew how to trap him because they knew his schedule. And what was his schedule? He would go up to his room three times a day, open his window towards Jerusalem, and pray. And he got trapped. His enemies trapped him because they knew his schedule. How many of you schedule time for prayer? How many of us make time for prayer? That's the key. He made time for prayer. He made time for it was prayer. His priority was just so important to him. Okay. I can sure learn from that. Okay. Parker? John Donnell tells me that he prays at night. He told me that a long time ago. Okay. He told a group of guys. Okay. Well, I try to do it in the morning. But I think habit, getting into a habit, is very important because that's what Daniel did. <laughs> Daniel did that. It's, it's, it's a, spending time with God is worth time. You know, um, friendships, marriages, parenting, all takes, you can't do those kind of jobs on the run. You can't have a relationship, a good marriage, a good raise, <coughs> raise fine children. You can't, you can't do that stuff without committing time to that relationship. 
Likewise with God. It takes time. How about knowing God? How do you get to know God? You've got to read the Word. God sent us His Word. He told us all about Himself in here. So, uh, that's one. Uh, you know, one thing, we, we may be spoiled a little bit because God's phone line is never busy. So we can talk to Him anytime. So maybe that makes us tend to give God our second best. Does anybody, I don't know, I, don't, I don't just ask, I don't, I don't want to necessarily ask for a show of hands. Does anybody have a special place where they go to pray? Daniel did. And he went to that special place on a schedule. You know, the prob problem, I used to teach time management a little bit at work. And time management, uh, you can let the world dictate to you what you're accomplishing, or you can say, these are the things I'm going to accomplish. I am going to be with God. That's my priority. Schedule your priorities. Don't prioritize your schedule. It's a reverse thing. Yes, Parker. Well, what comes to my mind is the Lord tells us to go into our closet. Okay. Now, to me, that, that means go into a private place where you won't be interrupted. And when Wherever I read that, it is. Yeah. yeah. And yes. When I read that, I think he refer, he's referring to our hearts. Look into our hearts. That's how I, my interpretation, go into your closet. I think it's, I don't know, maybe I'm dead wrong. Maybe I'm seeing it wrong. But it is, uh, it could be both. Let me put it this way. It could be both. But what Jesus said, go spend some time alone with God. Jesus went off, as we mentioned several times in this class, Jesus went off by himself regularly to pray. When he started his ministry, he went into the desert for 40 days and fasted and prayed. He was alone out there. He went to be alone with God. To pray. Jeanette? I have several people that have made like a little building off to, to the side of their house. Huh? And that was their prayer uh, <coughs> and where they went to have mm -hmm. meditation and pray. Yeah, and, and also when Jesus said, Go into your closet and pray, and what you pray in secret, your father will answer in public. Uh, he, did, he wasn't saying show off your prayer life. Right. He was saying be mine. <laughs> he wasn't saying build this little special house that you can show off to your neighbors that this right. is where I go pray. Uh, he's, he was saying be mine. Uh, I just think the big, big hindrance to prayer is time and commitment to doing that. And we eat we make sure we eat. We make sure we sleep. We also make sure we pray. All right. Uh, next question. What is there about preparation? Does prayer need preparation? Does anybody remember? Does anybody in here have any clue who Bud Wilkinson is? A few do. Bud Wilkinson was a football coach at the University of Oklahoma. He won in the 1950s. He won five national championships. He was coach at Oklahoma from what 47 to 63. Won five national championships. Oklahoma was always number one or two when Bud Wilkinson was the coach. Anyway, Bud Wilkinson said, um, it's not the will to win, it's the will to prepare. <coughs> said, uh, great things demand great preparation. I, I, in part of, my, part of my career, I planned, I got into for about 20 years to planning some large conferences 
where we had anywhere from 300 people to 1,500 people, and we had a three or four day conference. And to plan, to put together a three or four day conference is kind of amazing when you look at the work and preparation that goes into doing that. We would have teams of 10, 15, 20, 25 people, and then we'd break those up into teams, and they would have volunteers planning what would happen in those four days. We couldn't just say, hey, we're going to all meet in Salt Lake City June 1st through 3rd and uh, have a great conference. We had to schedule time for all those people, all the events to happen, and it all had to be planned and get speakers arranged, get all kinds of stuff. There was a lot of preparation to pulling off a successful conference. So what's wrong with preparing to pray? How would you? How would you prepare to pray? It says pray without ceasing, so there's no prep in that. <laughs> there's no prep in praying without ceasing? Okay. We'll discuss that later on in this study, maybe, but I, I want to talk about that. Yeah. Well, you know, I mean, life happens, and, you know, you're, someone may tick you off, and you may respond in a way that you wish you hadn't, and before going to God, you want to make sure things are right with, with your brother. Okay. So that may be part of the preparation. That may be part of the preparation, making sure you're not hindered by your relationship with your spouse, maybe. Or uh, how about we, every Sunday we get a prayer list. I, I can't, I don't mean to criticize anybody when I say things, because I say the same things, okay? But many times I've stood up here leading prayer and going, Lord, I can't remember all the sick, but you know who they are. We pray for them. Is that good or bad? Kind of to me says, well, I didn't care enough to see if that person who's on that sick list. <laughs> that's that's what it says to me about my prayer. Okay, I'll just I'm going to put it on me. What's wrong with uh, bringing? If you're going to lead public prayers, uh, most of us don't like this. But what would be wrong wrong with bringing a a prayer that you've written out? up to pray. Louis? Well, for many years, I would use my business cards and tell them why I wouldn't have a written out prayer, but I would have subjects that I want to cover. Okay. And I, I encourage young men in, to do that. You know, they're praying for the whole congregation. Right. It occurred to me as I was studying this that most of the Psalms or David's written prayers, are they not? So David took the time to write his prayers. If, if you're coming into the presence of God, there's nothing wrong with having written down what you want to pray. Well, I mean, that's neither here nor there because that's God's judgment. That's not ours. I, I know, but it's just <laughs> that, that I have, you know, and that means yeah. I'm listening to, like, when you pray tonight. All right, I just. You know, you have to listen and to yeah. know, you know, you, you have to know in your heart what, okay. you know. I'll, I'll use an example from my life. If I got a chance. Our age, my, I worked for a federal agency, so it was organized uh, with several hierarchies or several layers of management. If I got a chance to meet with the state director, I wanted to be sure and let the state director know what all I was doing. So I prepped for that meeting. 
if I got a chance to meet with the national head of the agency, I prepped myself for that meeting. There's nothing wrong. It's a good thing, folks. It's a good thing to pray, to prep your mind, to pray to God. It's a good thing. <laughs> it's a good thing to think about what you want to ask for. But as, we're, as we've seen, we don't know what to ask for. Romans 8, 6, if I remember that right. We don't even know how to pray, but we, we need to work at it. We need to work at building a relationship with God. Prayer is work. It takes time. It takes, as Jamar said, we bear ourselves before God. It's not something easy to do. It's something that requires work. It's an effort on our part. Uh, the busier we are, the more we need to pray. <clears throat> Am I correct when I say that no matter what we say, no matter how we pray, it goes through Jesus to be cleaned up before it's presented to God? Romans 8, 6. Holy Spirit intercedes for us because we don't know how to exactly. pray. Okay? Uh, question three. What happens when we neglect prayer? What's James 4, 2 say? Somebody have that? Somebody read it. James what? Four. James 4, 2. You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet, but you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and you fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. Okay. We don't receive because we don't ask. Or another passage in James says, we ask with doubt. We need to understand that God will answer our prayer. God will give us what we need. That's how God deals with us. Uh, our, greatest, our greatest sin and mistake is not praying. Let's, uh, Luke 18, where, Luke, where Jesus told the parable of the, of the woman who was asking the unrighteous judge and pestering the unrighteous judge. Jesus told us to pray and don't give up. And to me, I'm going to give you a hint. To me, that's prayer without that's prayer without ceasing. Not being a constant mode of prayer, but don't giving up. Don't give up on seeking God. Don't give up on praying. Uh, <clears throat> God's far more willing to bless us than we may be willing to receive. Sonia. Exactly. We're saying, well, God, you don't answer my prayers anyway. Many, sometimes, sometimes, or sometimes we're saying, God, I'm too busy. You don't have priority in my life. <laughs> uh, so failing to pray is, is exposing our relationship to God. Uh, this reminds me of a cousin I was having a conversation with, him, and he said, man, that stuff don't work. <laughs> it's, it's funny. <laughs> I mean, yeah. It's, it's it's uh given that God is God and we are human, it's kind of arrogant to not pray. It's trusting ourselves instead of God. Yes. So I also think that when we distance ourselves from God, we give Satan the opportunity to creep in. Absolutely, we open the door for Satan. Satan's real good at hindering us. That we have all these schedules, we have other things that pop up to keep us from doing the things that need to be done, the priorities that need to be done. Remember, Jesus said in Matthew 7, 7 and 8, ask, seek, knock. And he said, you will receive, you will find, and the door will be opened. God, God's made promises to us for prayer. Is it so? Then is it our place to decide if something's too big or too small for God to answer our prayers? 
No. God is God. He made everything from the neutron to the universe. So think about that a little bit. Uh, so what is the foundation of true prayer? Believing that God exists. Believing that God exists. The relationship with God. I'm, I'm still on that. I can't move on. Bingo. A right relationship with God. Believing that he <laughs> requires you believe he exists. Right, you have to start there. <laughs> you got to have a, real, a right relationship ship from God uh, we must be saved not lost we may not like what I'm about to say here we must be God's children not Satan's we must be uh, prayer and disobedience do not mix uh, Here's some, let me read you quickly some of the more than 30 scriptures that tell us this. He who turns away his ear from listening to the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Proverbs 28, 9. The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord. Proverbs 15, 8. The Lord is far from the wicked, but he hears the prayers of the righteous. Proverbs 15, 29. If I regard wickedness in my heart, the Lord will not hear. Psalm 66, 18. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous, and his ears attend to their prayer. But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. 1 Peter 3, 12. And whatever we ask, we receive from him because, because we keep his commandments and do the things that are pleasing in his sight. 1 John 3, 22. The prayer of Cornelius in Acts 10.2 is the only exception to a saved person not hearing. But I will say this about Cornelius. He was seeking a relationship. He was seeking to be right with God. So for God to hear our prayers, that's, that's the foundation of true prayer. And I ask you the question, why would God listen to us if we won't listen to Him? He should. Huh? He will. You don't. You don't think He will? If we're not listening to Him, it seems like we would. He, <coughs> we're falsely tagging. Yeah. Who we think we are. Sin keeps us from prayer, Sonia. <laughs> Uh, and prayer, on the other hand, keeps us from sin. I mean, which makes sense because, you know, the wicked, they're not praying. You know, that makes sense, right? <laughs> they're so far right. gone, you don't need to pray. Yeah. Uh, we don't, and, and as that comes about, we don't behave ourselves and act good to be blessed. It's just that God blesses the good. It's not bribery. It's not tricking God into doing things. God blesses good people that want to be right with Him. Amen. Okay. Me? Louis. Well, that's, a, that's a real thought-provoking question because uh, most people in the world, uh, religiously, believe that they can pray to God and get what they want. Uh, and that would be salvation, forgives the sins, whatever. And they and they they believe in their heart that God will answer their prayers because of what the Bible says. But the Bible also says he will not listen. There's the, the uh, not only in second second Samuel seven fourteen it says he will hear you, but there's another one in somewhere in the 20s chapter and they come to ask God and says don't, don't, I don't want to talk to you. I know what you are and I don't want to talk to you. Mm -hmm. Paraphrased. But you know people with their religious beliefs believe that they can pray and God will answer them no matter what their lives are. 
Yes, Satan works many ways. <laughs> Satan tricked Eve, remember? He said, God lied to you. You won't die. Parker? I know you mentioned Cornelius, but, but I have another example. Okay. And that's in Acts 17. Okay. Where Paul is talking to those at Mars Hill. Okay. And he's talking about the creation of the whole world. Mm -hmm. And he says in 26, and he has made from one blood every nation of man to dwell on all the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwelling so that they should seek the Lord in the hope that they might grope for him and find him, though he is not far from each one of us. You know what I'm saying here? He said that those who are seeking the Lord, they will find him. Those who seek the Lord will find him. Yep. I agree 100%. Those and who seek the Lord will find him. Yeah. But it can include everybody. Yeah. <clears throat> Cornelius is a good example of that. Well, that's what, that's what yeah. he said. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I'm okay. Next question. We're down to four minutes. So, <laughs> Question five. How does doubt hinder our prayer? James 1, 5, and 6. You don't have enough faith. James says if a man who asks in doubt is like a, a wave driven by the wind. player who, you know, he has the pads on, but he's kind of, he's hesitant when he's out there. That's how I would play at least. And that's the guy who's going to get hurt. <laughs> As opposed to the guy who's, you know, he's full throttle. I always am amazed that, you know, no matter whether you're wearing, winning a Grammy, an Emmy, a Super Bowl championship, or championship of any sort, everyone always says, all you have to do is believe. You they know, always so say the that. the world has that, you know. That they have that single-minded tunnel vision. Nothing can get in my way. I'm not distracted. And it breeds success. And it involves preparation, though, too. That's right. <clears throat> exactly. Doubt. We must believe that what we believe is right. You know, Hebrews 11 tells us faith is this assurance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. We must have no doubt that God exists, that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior, and that Jesus is coming again. Whatever we pray for needs to be in, in, in those lights, in, in, those, in that vein. So uh, prayer then is faith speaking to God, is it not? Uh, Timothy 2.8, I think that's where... I command men everywhere to lift holy hands in prayer. Uh, that's <coughs> that's what we're told. It's what we're supposed to do. We're supposed to pray, and so that's part of our our uh, DNA as Christians is to pray. Uh, doesn't mean people in the Bible ask for all kinds of things. It doesn't mean they always got what they asked for. You know, we've used the example of Paul several times uh, praying for the, his thorn in the flesh, we don't know what that was, to be removed. And God's answer was, my grace is sufficient for you. He got grace instead of getting that thorn removed. <clears throat> uh, so, Paul got grace but what did Paul do with that grace? He went all over the world teaching. He faced mobs teaching, teaching Jesus Christ, teaching the world about Jesus. Parker? That grace is an unmerited favor. No. So he got God's favor. He got God's favor. Which and, is the grace. And what did it drive him to do? Go all through the world. Go all through the world. Uh, you, statement made by Brother Hodges, you will achieve little or nothing under your own power. Yet God will not give you much 
unless you work with all your might. God wants us on his team, on his side, working for him. And what really has hit me, now we're at 7.30, so what really hits me through all this study is that God rewards those who seek him and his wrath is reserved for those who don't. It's kind of hitting home to me through all of this. Uh, <clears throat> and then the sixth, the last question is uh, our relationships with others. Matthew eleven twenty five, Matthew six fourteen fifteen, Proverbs twenty one thirteen. If we're not willing to forgive others, if we don't forgive others, we won't be forgiven. So forgiveness. The right relationship with God is contingent on our getting along with our fellow humans and forgiving them when, they're when they go against us. God will not forgive if we do not. Can we ask God to do for us what we refuse to do for others? Matthew 6, 12. Then, uh, Some would say, yeah, he's God. <laughs> Well, I'm going to close with this poem and then ask uh, Dave if you would lead us in a closing prayer. Let justice rule in all the earth and mercy while we live, lest we, forgiven much, forget our brothers to forgive. That's by Ernest B. Allen. Next week, inter intercessory prayer, which is interesting. Can you change someone else's life by praying and is that ethical? <laughs> Think about that. Luke 22, 31 through 34 is what we'll be looking at. Dave? Our Father in heaven, we come before you tonight studying prayer and hoping that our prayers are heard by you as we know that you say they are. And that through our prayers, we improve our lives and our faith and our devotion to you. Guide us this week. Bring us back some. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 amen.